Thank you for having me. Before I begin, I tell all my audiences that I answer all my mail. I write four to six hundred personal letters a month, and I've done it for about 40 years, and I'm caught up, even though I'm on the road 300 days a year. I've never used a computer or had an iPhone. I'm actually not attracted to them. They're machines. I'm attracted to people. And so, ironically, I'll tell you to get my address on our website, patchadams.org. I've not been to our website because I don't know how to get to one. But my address is there in Illinois, and I, again, for example, I just spent two weeks in Russia and a week in Chechnya, and so I got home for nine hours and flew here, and in that time I got all the mail that accumulated, and I answered most all of it on my flight here. So if you need a friend, if you have dreams no one will listen to, or you want ideas, that's me. So write me. You can also hate what I'm saying and curse me, which is also fun. I'm going to give you my history, which I think is a history following the qualities that I've heard about this wonderful organization and what you're being presented today. I'm 68 years old. I grew up in a military family. The U.S. loves killing people all over the world. And I uh, grew up mostly outside the U.S. on military bases. My father died from war when I was 16. And so in 1961, I moved back to the U.S. And I grew up a skinny, nerd, dweeb, dork, sissy boy, to give you an idea of what my background is, and I've kind of stayed there. And in 1961, we moved to the U.S. to the South, which I really didn't know much about because I grew up outside the U.S., and I was put in an all-white school, and I had the allergic reaction of my life. I realized my country was fake, religion was fake, and the adult world was an embarrassment, and that people were actually denied toilets, drinking fountains, restaurants, and hotels because of the color of their skin. And uh, I, I really lost my mind. I couldn't believe these things. And I wept and wept and wept. I went to school and was put in an all-white school, and I was beaten up almost every day my last two years in high school because I couldn't be silent. It's a problem. And Three times in one year, 17 and 18, I was hospitalized because I was trying to kill myself. I didn't want to live in a world of violence and injustice. Everything you love about me came from my mom, and she never did an act of injustice or unkindness or inconsiderateness in her life. And between the second and third hospitalization, I was present at Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech with a million people saying, let's have something different. I still needed one more hospitalization, maybe threes a set or something. But in that third hospitalization, lightning struck and said, you don't kill yourself, you dummy. You make revolution. Ah, what a word, revolution. Yes. But what revolution? So I decided what we needed was a revolution of love. And I made two decisions that have shaped my life ever since then, now for 50 years. The first, in a country that medicine isn't a healthcare system, it's a vulgar, greedy business. I decided that I would be a free physician, and I've been a free physician for 43 years. Never made any money in the practice of medicine. That was an easy decision. The other decision was much more personal. How can I be an instrument for peace and justice and care in every second of my life? And so I decided that I would be disgustingly, revoltingly happy all of the time the rest of my life. And I have been uninterruptedly happy for 50 years. It was when I realized that my mother gave me the greatest gift I think a parent can give their children, and that is she gave me self-esteem, which means I can do it. So as soon as I decided I didn't have to develop into a person that did it, I just had to decide on which performance to give in a given moment for those decisions. A way to say it poetically is, when I left that hospital, I dove into the ocean of gratitude and never found the shore. 
I live and stay afloat in the sweet gratitude of this precious thing called life. And a way to say that I chose to be happy all of the time, it was very quick that I realized it was actually six qualities I had decided, happy, funny, loving, cooperative, creative, and thoughtful, that I was going to be that as a person all the time. I am a nerd. My library is about 40,000 books, and there's no John Grisham. And uh, so I'm a reader. For example, I know four hours of poetry by heart. I, I love great literature and have done a huge amount of life in that. And I have done a lot of thinking about the mind, and I know this conference is about the mind. I have my own theories. I think evolution physically gave us the opposable thumb and upright posture, but what did it do for our mind? And, and I believe things like thinking and love and humor were evolutionary steps to make healthy groupness, because as group primates for 80 million years, we were getting more and more complicated, and it's hard enough to live with ourselves or a couple, much less as a group. And so we needed thinking and love and humor, et cetera, in order to be a healthy group of people. And in that context, I think of the emotions as the sense organs of the mind, as vision is a sense organ for sight, that how does the mind have tools to do its thinking? And I think that's why they have the emotions, and so they're not really bad emotions, that I go to war zones and have held 2,000 children the day they died of starvation in my arms, and it makes me sad and angry. That's the right emotion. It goes up to the mind, not to linger in sad and angry, which is where most people uh, do with the emotions in this day and age, but it goes up to the mind and it says, think. If you don't like violence, if you don't like hunger, end it, and use your mind and skills in uh, change to make that happen. So, in deciding to be those six qualities, I have a little formula, intention, performance, and consequences. So I will love life is an intention. I'm not saying I'll try to love life. I could love life. I should love life. I will love life. So there's no option from the second I wake up to the second I go to bed, I will love life as a political act. So having an intention, what is your job? It's to, in a given moment, given a set of circumstances, your life experience and your love of improvisation, what performance will put that intention forward and how did you do? Kind of a cybernetic thing, so you have an immediate feedback system and if you don't like the consequences, you change it. And that's as true in medicine as it has been in clowning. I've been a clown every day for 50 years. And uh, it is who I am, and it is a clown who is a doctor, not a doctor who is a clown. And so I left that hospital on fire. I was one of those people at 18 that was too weird to get dates, and I never had to study anything. So I had all this free time. And I went out there as an extreme extrovert to engage the world, to fall in love with humanity. I spent two hours a day for two years, every single day, calling up wrong numbers to practice talking with people. You know, what tone, what timbre, what ideas, what thoughts would make a person want to stay on the phone with me and get curious and be a little sorry when I said I had to go? I still love to do it. I spent 10 hours a week for two years going up and down elevators in Washington, D.C., because once that door shuts, there they are, your people. And no exit, of course, so yay. <laughs> because I was wondering, what kind of person did I need to be so that if I saw a person on the elevator that was hurting, that I could go right up to them and engage them as a fellow human being and, and love them. And I'll give you some tricks, both of clowning and being human. That is, develop your sparkly eyes. Twinkle, twinkle, twinkle. And notice when they're twinkling, smile hits your face. It's, in a way, I see the smile as the sharp part of the wedge, 
and the twinkling eyes as the fat part of the wedge. The smile starts something that the eyes are much deeper uh, in that journey. And so I, I went to college and got in medical school after three years because I kind of spent that year being nuts and I thought I wanted to be a doctor quickly. And I entered medical school with the idea to create a medical model that would address every single problem of the way care was delivered in one model because it's an embarrassment, our healthcare system. 95% of my professors were white, arrogant pricks. That's a diagnosis, not a criticism. <laughs> and so there are almost no doctors who acted like a doctor from what I felt a doctor might be, a servant for love and care for people. And so I didn't have to study much in school. I, I created, when I graduated in 1971, the Gesundheit Institute, a hospital. And of course, no one gave me a hospital. Here, Patch, have a hospital. And so I did what people do in poor countries. We made our home a hospital. 20 adults, three of us physicians, moved into a large six-bedroom house and said we were a hospital, open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all manner of medical problems from birth to death. We ran this pilot for 12 years. During this time, we had 500 to 1,000 people in our home each month with five to 50 overnight guests a night. Now, you heard it, six bedroom house with 20 adults and their children there, five to 50 overnight guests a night. If I told you from the very beginning we decided to use no psychiatric diagnoses or psychiatric medication, I think you could say our house was an interesting place to be. 3,000 of the 15,000 people that came to our home had severe mental health problems and we never gave any medication. We actually saw it as free live theater and quite interesting at that. So there were nights when like a six foot nine, very muscular man stood on the dining room table naked yelling, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And of course they could, as long as no physical violence, but verbally you could be creative. And, and so you can be nuts and we can be nuts. So we might stand up and going, ah, fuck you, fuck you, ah. And, and it was kind of like a Monty Python medical facility, if you're familiar with that British group. We did barf alongs with bulimics. I mean, we, we had no loyalty to professional uh, distance. And very quickly, we, you know, let me tell you what we did. Everything was free, okay? And it wasn't free for poor people. We wanted to eliminate the idea of debt in the medical interaction. We never wanted anyone to think they owed something. We wanted them excited that they belonged to something called community because we have lost the true nature of community of, as a nest of care, certainly in the United States. We also, in that same flavor, never had anything to do with insurance companies because we never heard anything nice said about an insurance company. And they control the way medicine is practiced in the U.S. And probably the most radical thing we did to the conservative population is that we're the only medical facility to refuse to carry malpractice insurance because, quite frankly, we need the right to make a mistake because we found out on the first day we didn't know the answers. We knew directions and, and close observations so ideally you don't hurt somebody. But we need that right. We didn't have patients sign waivers. We didn't care if you sued us. What would you sue us for? We didn't have anything. <laughs> so, and I'm a family doctor, and you know, I was trained to be a doctor in 7.8 minutes, and you can be something in 7.8 minutes, but you cannot be a doctor. Why would they teach you all that stuff? My initial interview with a new adult patient is four hours long, unbelievably intense four hours. I usually know you better than anyone knows you. I ask every question sensitive to life. There's not a part of your personal privacy I don't inquire about on the first date. And spending that kind of time with patients, I realize that the vast majority of our adult population has no idea what health is about. I found no more than 3% of the people I've interviewed in 48 years had self-esteem. Almost no one loves himself. I love me. Yay, me. 
Less than 5% had any idea what a day-to-day -day vitality for life was about. Yay, life! Oh, yeah! <laughs> On your worst day. In fact, the normal adult in the United States didn't like themselves, didn't like their marriage, didn't like their work, and that wasn't why they were coming to the doctor. They thought that was what you put up with in life. Most patients had nothing to do with being well. In medical school, I didn't get one lecture on being well, not even diet and exercise, much less love and spirit or any of the other great things in life. And so we wondered, how can we trick people to floss their teeth? One way we tricked people into aerobic exercise is we had three all-night rock and roll parties a week. We weren't exercising, we were partying. Ah, okay. Where the ethic was dance as long as you can because I'd have a patient come in and say, bring some music you'll dance as long as you can to and then come to a party and dance as long as you can and the average person could dance three times longer in the company of people than they can by themselves. And that's, you know, opening the door to an education of receiving energy from other people.